TR-808. Look at it. The rolling TR-808 rhythm composer. The first totally analog, fully programmable drum machine ever. Listen to that. Deep, sensual bass drum, a staccato snare, just slightly reverberated clap, crispy little hi-hats, the toms and congas from the future. I love the TR-808. Of course, you've heard these sounds for years in R&B, soul, reggae, hip-hop, electro, quiet storm, jazz explorations, all-time anthems from stars like the SOS Band, Marvin Gaye, Whitney Houston, The Talking Heads, Loose Ends, even New Kids on the Block. Years later, Kanye West, Lil Wayne, and everyone else it seems these days. These sounds are classic, and they ring out today as clearly and as powerful as they did the first time we ever heard them. But when did we first hear them? Why are we always talking about top 40 artists and mega stars when we want to qualify the history and validity of the equipment we love? In 1979, the world was about to change. Jimmy Carter was a one-term president who presided over both the rise and fall of mainstream disco. The emergence of punk rock, new wave, heavy metal, and the unsustainable hedonism of the 1970s. Remember, even Kiss made a disco album. <laughs> Blondie, the almost punk band from New York City, had a smash with their disco single Heart of Glass, which featured a Roland CR-78 rumba preset. Phil Collins made timeless magic with In the Air Tonight, the same machine. These weren't actually completely programmable. You were able to program a kick and a snare using the WS-1 controller, add fill-in, variation, control the levels, a few different sounds in a pattern, but for the most part, they replayed presets from a bank of styles reminiscent of the percussion accompaniment from a home organ intended for family sing-alongs. But wait, here I am talking about superstars again. In 1980, hot on the heels of disco's demise, everyone was looking for a new sound for a new decade. His early drum machine successes sparked new interest in new instruments, but Marvel Gay seemed to have both the first and last word on the subject because the Roland TR-808 was considered a commercial failure. Produced from 1980 to 1983, Roland sold barely 12,000 of them. And while that sounds like a lot to me, it was far below their expectations, and so by 83, it was time to move on. But what is the TR-808 Rhythm Composer? What's the big deal? What does it do? How does it work? The 808 introduced a 16-step sequencing interface, all on a masked NEC integrated circuit ROM. Here's what that means. First, you select the instrument to program. Press the buttons for the beats you'd like it to play. Move on to the next instrument, program the rest of the beat. If you don't want to push a bunch of buttons, you can select your instrument and tap in the rhythm that you want to play manually. You can select pattern A or pattern B. You can alternate between pattern A and B, adjust the scale, change the length, set it up to autofill, and then combine your patterns together into a track. It sends or receives din sync clock. And in addition to the internal analog instrument sounds, there are trigger outs for triggering other machines to create clocks for sequencers, playback samples, or sounds from other instruments. That's pretty sweet, right? What was introduced in the TR-808 in 1980 remains the gold standard for drum machine programming, against which everything is measured. It's not the only way to program a beat, but it's the clearest, most visual, and immediate step sequencing drum machine interface to date. What we aren't talking about is that all through the 1970s, electronic music was on the rise. Kraftwerk, David Bowie, Brian Eno, Ultravox, Klaus Nomi, Throbbing Gristle, Supermax, Japan, Tangerine Dream, Pink Floyd, Stevie Wonder, Sylvester, 10CC, Gary Newman, The Human League, Giorgio Moroder, Cerrone, even Carly Simon and Cat Stevens were sitting down at synthesizers and making brand new exciting sounds. The triumph of an elaborate, amazing synthesizer came with a massive price tag. So these were the tools of the establishment. Dreamers were left to dream or to try their hand at building their own. The 1980s introduced a culture that was done being heavy and meaningful. We wanted bright colors, shoulder pads, big hair, and shiny new things which didn't remind us of dashikis, kufis, or bell-bottoms at all. So, 
secondhand shops filled up with the TR-808, and it wound up in the hands of some of the most visionary artists who would shape the next 20 to 30 years. Africa Bombada, Derek May, Juan Atkins, Larry Hurd, a guy called Gerald, and from this basement renaissance came Miami bass, Italo disco, electro, hip-hop, techno, hip-house, acid house, and more. Power to the people. Right on. So this is the story that pretty much everybody already knows. Ikutaro Kakahashi and the chief engineer developed this programmable machine that Marvin Gaye championed it in the charts. Stetsasonic, Strafe, Cybertron, Soul Sonic Force, Eric B. and Rakim, Public Enemy, all got a hold of it and changed the world. It is a great story. But why did it change the world? What did it change it from? And what has it become? Consider that 1979 was actually 40 years ago. That's about enough time for someone to be born, grow up, get cute, have an entire career, give up, get old, and be forgotten. It's like making reference to the musical influences that 1915 had on the early rock and roll artists of 1955. In 1955, 1915 was like a billion years ago. We're still talking about 1979 like it was yesterday. And at the end of the 70s, we still imagine that the year 2000 was a long way off. I'm pretty sure everybody was totally expecting world peace and flying cars, too. The vision of the future was very different from what actually happened. In 1980, we saw technology as a labyrinth of hand-wired panels with scientists in white jumpsuits operating computers the size of a gymnasium, and our dreams of the future were still handmade. All the decisions were to be made by us. There wasn't any question about if the technology would be accurate or not. The question was all about the integrity and intention of the operators. So out of the underground of New York, Miami, Chicago, London, Manchester, Rome, and Berlin came in new sounds made for the people, by the people, and it sounded exactly like the future. Like all wonderful, liberating ideas, the first people to do something rarely received the recognition. So following this amazing burst into a new decade, new wave, and eventually just pop music in general, took on the search for the perfect beat and the sound of the synthesizer. For a couple of summers, it was all about Fiorucci boots, bright pink t-shirts, and all the pretty Euro trash at Studio 54. And that was that. But we weren't done dancing yet. Out of Chicago, Frankie Knuckles came up with a new take on an old idea of people getting together late at night and dancing while no one was watching. Larry LeVan was doing the exact same thing in New York City. Adonis, Ron Hardy, Kevin Saunderson, Jeff Mills, Blake Baxter, Carl Craig, Derek Carter, and so many more began to move a lot more than just their local discotheques. The world was moving to a brand new rhythm. It was being programmed on Roland TR-808. And it was clear this sound was not the found creativity of secondhand machine operators, but a visionary creative force that would change the world all over again. Soon, other instruments and completely new machines came into focus. This defined subdivisions of the sounds, creating genres and monikers meant to distinguish but inevitably would marginalize and specify particular styles so precisely that the center, of course, would not hold. But everything that rises must converge, and that's why the TR-808 in context is a catalyst of cultural revolution and a defining vision of the future. Today, there are so many replicants. The Acid Lab Miami, the Electronic Yakto, the Roland Aria TR-8, the Roland Boutique TR-08, the System 8880, and even the TR-606. They all offer XOX style programming, familiar shimmering hi-hats, little burst of a snare drum, cyborg toms and congas, and an unmistakable cowbell. Except for the 606, it never had a cowbell or a hand clap.
Okay. While many people have spent too much time arguing about the validity of replicants and clones, the simple facts remain. The best drum machine in the world is the one that's right in front of you. You can copy the circuit design, the component values of the original 808, but mysteriously no one has perfectly duplicated it yet. So it's totally up to the user. Can you afford 4,500 bucks for a 40 year old drum machine? Or you want to grab a replicant and get back to the business of revolution? It's really not an easy question to answer, but there's nothing quite like the original. And the clones are pretty cool too. Personally, I will always vote for what democratizes the sounds and puts the best instruments into the hands of the most people. That guarantees more music will be made and there will be more beats for us to dance to. Looking at it this way, our love and affection for the original, as well as our enthusiasm for replicants, is a valid and bona fide chance to take a step back, examine a previous vision of the future. Maybe where we've gone since 1983 isn't what we had in our hearts and minds. Maybe we're still hoping for a future with flying cars, huge panels, hand-wired harnesses, impressive knobs, individual outputs, rock-solid pre-programmed operating systems, and din sync. In a perfect world, I'd like to have both and avoid the choice completely. I love the TR-808, the computer-controlled analog rhythm composer, the sound of the bedroom, the sound of the nightclub, the sound of the studio, the sound of the warehouse, the sound of the future. <laughs>